But hey, look at that. It's um, just on 1900 now. So um, we may as well get on with things and uh, get this thing done. Cheers, Joshy. Appreciate it, man. Okay, so um, most of you will be pretty aware of who I am, uh, what I do um, in terms of my background and so on. But for those of you who aren't, I uh, thought I'd go and give a bit of an introduction as such. So I'm the man behind the mask uh, of Pracmed NZ. Um, basically, um, I spent uh, just under 11 years in the NZDF. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, had a great time, deployed operationally four times, uh, a couple of times to Afghanistan uh, and to Indonesia uh, on my first, first deployment overseas. But when we stopped going overseas, I didn't join up to walk around Waiuru being cold, so <laughs> got out uh, and went and applied my trade overseas. Um, basically, this is where the kind of story of Prakmed NZ comes from. Um, and that was um, basically, uh, once I got out, went overseas, did a bunch of courses overseas and realised there was a massive deficit uh, in our training, um, particularly surrounding uh, that trauma. The first initial reactions that people can do uh, and have uh, initially after uh, a contact or, or when someone's been injured uh, make a huge, huge difference on the, on the outcome. So that was um that was just massive um for me it was a real a real awakening i spent um just about 5 years overseas i finished up uh at the end of 2017 came home uh, and started working uh for another outfit um delivering first aid courses realized uh things weren't really that great within the industry uh tried to change internal bureaucracy the rest is history i left uh and started prac media z Basically, that's where we are sitting today. Pragmed NZ's been alive since officially since 2018, uh, and we've just been absolutely stomping on the heads, uh, maintaining or setting the standards, uh, just absolutely crushing it. So anyway, I think that's probably enough about uh, me. What we're going to go through tonight um, is we're going to go through and we're going to uh, essentially break down why uh, we carry IFACs uh, or an IFAS as we prefer to call them, um, the individual first aid system or kits, okay? Um, basically what you should have inside of it, the purposes, uh, and hopefully this actually gives you the basis to make a decision um, and quite frankly I don't care whether it's with uh, Pracmed that you purchase uh, or anywhere else but it gives you the basis for a really really uh, good and informed decision about what you should have inside of there and why uh, it's there. The reason I guess why we're doing this is uh, because time and time out I have people coming through on courses, I have people messaging me going oh hey man can you check out my IFAC, can you check out this, uh, can we have a look at that and that's awesome, I encourage those people to continue doing that um, but I just thought it would, we'd just go to the masses and just try and catch people before um, A they come onto the courses and B uh, before they uh, end up having to try and use this stuff or uh, if they don't have any stuff in the first instance. So um, that's what we're doing, it's trying to provide the basis for a uh, intelligent decision behind what you're actually carrying. I just want to go through, uh, make it really aware as well, um, that we do have a sale on at the moment uh, with the courses that we run. Uh, Stop Bleed, we've got uh, those coming up, we've got Essential First Aid Skills which count as a refresher, uh, even though they're not actually uh, NZQA unit standard. We've got our big meeting with them next week, so uh, wish us luck for that. I'm pretty sure we won't need it, but either way, uh, if you log on through us, uh, the code that you can use if you do want to jump onto a course is SAFETY20. That's capital, uh, capitals all the way through and numerical two zero. So um, yeah, anyway, we'll, we'll get right into things, shall we, uh, team? I think it's about time we actually start talking about the core subject. Okay, so what is the uh, difference between an IFAC and a regular first aid kit? Uh, I think this is really, really important to understand because there seems to be this huge misconception. And first of all, uh, and I'll do my best, I've been told off all afternoon about this, acronyms, 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 IFAC, Individual First Aid Kit, or as we call it, Individual First Aid System here at PracMed. So what is the difference between an IFAC and a regular first aid kit? Well, this is um, a question which kind of comes across a, a, a little bit, I guess, but also um, is something that a lot of military people, I suppose, assume uh, the understanding is there. An IFAC is designed or should be designed as simplicity as possible, or simply as possible. It should have the minimum amount of equipment in there to do the maximum amount for a person in a life-threatening uh, situation. A first aid kit, and this is just my opinion, a first aid kit is there for your boo-boos. Okay, so if you want to plaster, if you want to go through, if you want to put on some butterfly stitches maybe, uh, or put some betadine on your, your grazed knee, then then, then you can go and you go, go, go into your first aid kit. Whereas an 
IFAS uh, or an IFAC is designed to essentially look after life-threatening injuries very, very quickly. Um, and the key word there is individual. So it's basically one per man in a military uh, kind of context or a tactical context, um, and that makes no difference. Whether you're a hunter, whether you're a shooter, whether you're, uh, you know, whatever else, it doesn't matter, construction site, whatever else, okay, you've got to make sure that you look after yourself in that sense. Um, so that that is probably the big difference. Um, it's, it's crazy, the, it's just kind of going on a little bit of a tangent here, it's crazy the amount of times that people walk into my courses and, you know, ask them kind of why why they come on the course, you know, and I always like to know why people come on board, uh, in particular the open courses, and they haven't been forced to go through. Uh, and that's because a, lo a lot of them are there for their own personal reasons. They'd be hunters, you know, uh, they, something may have happened to them historically um, or somebody around them, somebody they care about, a lot like myself. That's kind of a sub story that we'll tell about uh, a little later on with uh, why PracMed started, why my passion uh, is definitely there. Um, and um, it always kind of fascinates me. Very few people kind of show up and uh, recognize that a lot of daily activities uh, can cause some serious, serious, serious hemorrhage, you know, car crashes, uh, work injuries, and so on and so forth. The amount of people that I've had walk through into the classroom uh, and who have watched people, uh, and this is just from their anecdotes, I can only assume I wasn't there, um, who have passed away from, uh, in, in particular, extremity hemorrhage, is just absolutely crazy. On the flip side, it's also really good uh, to go through and see uh, people winning as well and we've had 33 people go through and actually save somebody's life uh, with some of our equipment and or the training that they've uh, gone through and done so that is um, that's huge so again just to recap um, the difference between a first aid kit and a IFAC or an IFAS is that one of them is going to save your life the other one's going to give you a door, door of the explorer uh, band-aid on your knee or your elbow if you've managed to skin um, in your clumsiness or, or during your accident. Um, so we're going to get into questions now, um, and the way I'm going to go through and try and deal with this is that we'll go through, we'll talk about the kit as we go through, but I'm going to talk about a few of, the, well, the question, I'm going to answer the questions as we go through, and I've structured them in a way uh, that will give you uh, a really good understanding, or it should provide you the basis uh, to go through and make a really good decision. So first of all, I'm a hunter, um, space is super limited, um, what should I carry on the outside uh, versus my pack, and um, this is a really, really good question. I'm a hunter myself, um, and you know, getting out there, yeah, I understand. Um, space is limited, so is weight. Um, coming from a uh, background in the military where we carried everything, literally everything, on our backs, uh, running about the place, weight is something you want to be conservative of. So, um, on your person, um, we're going to talk a little bit, uh, kind of the, the the civilian context or the hunting recreational context versus. Uh, the, the tactical context here as well. So first of all, uh, with regards to what what are you most likely kind of going to uh, be involved with or what's the most likely accident or injury that you're going to face? Probably wounds to your extremities. Um, that slips, trips and falls where you may have, uh, you know, uh, sustained uh, or, or slipped and maybe put a knife through your leg or into your arm. Uh, and, and that was part of the reason why Prakmed got started as well. Uh, story I read in the paper there. But going through and understanding that you need to have uh, something, i.e. a tourniquet, uh, basically right there on you so that you can control uh, hemorrhage uh, from a limb or an extremity um, is super important because most likely that's what you're going to be dealing with in terms of uh, bleeding control or, or have any kind of cause and effect on. So that is super, super important. Um, for me personally, what I carry, uh, I actually have a battle belt as such or basically a bum bag. Um, that I roll around and that has my binoculars in it. Um, it carries uh, my knife, my string, uh, it has my range, well, binos rangefinder, um, and that also has my uh, individual first aid kit there as well. So what I have in there is um, obviously my tourniquet and all the other bits and pieces as well. We'll go through that a little bit later on um, as we kind of roll through. Um, but the tourniquet, of course, is the most accessible item. Um, and also, uh, on my hunting partner's belt, um, she also carries a tourniquet, which is readily available, uh, and then extra gear as well inside of her bum bag. So um, to be really uh, kind of blunt about it, I guess, uh, tourniquet, okay? Make sure that you always have one on you. Make sure it's, um, it's, it's right there with you. Now, I'm just going to talk about this a little bit with the more tactical context, because this is kind of one that a lot of people get wrapped up around as well, 
uh, with regard to um, how much kit they should be carrying, you know, oh, this pouch is too big or it's too little or should I have it on the uh, back of me or the front of me or whatever else. Um, and I'm not going to say that one solution is going to fix everything. Um, for, for the tactical guys out there, for anybody who's in that kind of environment or in that role, uh, it should be accessible with one hand. The principle uh, that we used to use or the principle that I've used for a long time is between the shoulders and the navel. So that gives you the ability to simply slap your hand onto your chest no matter whether you're upside down, uh, kind of roly-poly a little bit, maybe uh, you know, disorientated, you know you're going to be able to get to that. Even if you've got you know, maybe injured shoulders or in a tight confined space or whatever else, that gives you instant accessibility uh, to uh, the tourniquet and the reason why I'm kind of harping on tourniquet a little bit uh, is because that is the in, in, a, in a military context not too many civilian studies have been done out there uh, we generally suck especially in New Zealand at keeping statistics um, but in a military context, that was the number one cause of avoidable or preventable death uh, in the battlefields and especially the early days of global war on terror, uh, think Afghanistan, Iraq, etc. was extremity hemorrhage. And that um, obviously can't be controlled uh, in many cases uh, by anything, especially when you're dealing with a lot of trauma, uh, by anything than, of course, a tourniquet. So making sure that we keep a tourniquet accessible, that is super, super, super uh, important. Um, moving on. <clears throat> What's the next thing that we have there? Uh, what are your non-negotiables for an everyday carry? <laughs> okay, uh, this is this is a good one. Okay, um, so for me um, and the people who know me, um, you you'll uh, you'll probably chuckle at this as well. Um, it may seem a little OTT. Uh, however, I've been in a number of uh, situations, and, and you can call me a shit magnet if you really want to. Um, but in terms of my, uh, in terms of what I carry, uh, almost constantly. So the first thing, uh, inside of a vehicle, uh, I have a main trauma bag, and it has basically all my uh, march stuff um, right up uh, with without moving outside the law or anything like that, but right up to BVM uh, where I can go through and uh, OPA airways uh, and everything like that. Um, in terms of the um, stuff that I carry me on me every day though, and stuff that's in, in terms of every single day, uh, inside my vehicle again, I've got my hook knife, uh, which is actually on top of the roof of my vehicle. And that was something that we used to do uh, when I was running teams uh, overseas was making sure that we had stuff which was accessible uh, no matter, again, where we kind of uh, landed or kind of went for a roly-poly or anything like that, um, uh, we, we could access that very, very quickly. And so a hook knife uh, trauma shares uh, is a really, really good thing to do. Um, the uh, the hook knife uh, or strap cutter that we have, the bench-made one, uh, I rock that one. Um, it is attached to the roof of the vehicle with a little bit of Velcro, uh, molly platform, and there's also a tourniquet attached to that as well. Um, in terms of when I roll out um, inside of my um, inside of my work bag, inside of you know if I'm going out to to do a course or whatever else, or if I've got a um, an event that I need to go to or whatever else, um, if I'm not taking that main bag with me, then it's pretty simple with an IFAS. Um, and inside of that, we've got the shears or hook knife. Uh, once again, uh, the hook knife is definitely my favourite for most applications. We're going to release a video on the uh, pros and cons of hook knives, hook knives versus shears soon. Um, definitely TQ, minimum of two. Uh, if, if I'm going to somewhere like, for instance, the rugby, and some people look at me strangely when I say, oh yeah, you know, I carry a tourniquet and maybe chest seals for rugby, um, but again, getting caught with your pants down is definitely not something I want to go ahead and do. Um, with regards to um, if I'm not having to go really light like that, um, then I'll definitely uh, carry additionally chest seals. Like I said before, uh, that's a non-negotiable. Uh, deal with any kind of penetrating chest uh, wound or chest, chest trauma. Um, I'll carry uh, S-roll packing gauze as well. And there was a really good question which just popped up before um, about hemostatics uh, or hemostatic impregnated gauze, I guess it was. Uh, hang on, where is it? Uh, pros and cons of hemostatic gauze. Okay, so the pros um, is that there is very limited uh, information or support uh, which is actually peer-reviewed around the uh, efficiency of hemostatic gauze as opposed to regular packing gauze. Uh, and this is basically uh, through independent studies, trials, etc. Uh, and in a non-clinical non, uh, environment, um, I can tell you right now from personal experience, it works just as well. Uh, going through and packing wound, in fact, uh, the first time that I ever had to pack a wound, um, it was actually with improvised materials. It was with uh, regular issue combine bandages, uh, and that was a necessity. We had literally nothing else, uh, and we just got busy with it. 
and it was a good result came out all right so yeah a few stitches a few new scars a few stories but um yeah got through uh absolutely fine so um in in in, in summary what am i saying here um yeah sure you know if you want that extra zero point uh zero 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 one percent of you know going through and stopping a bleed uh great you know uh you can buy your 75 dollar roll of uh quick clot or whatever else uh personally i prefer or i think that it is much more effective to go through and spend that money on learning how to pack a wound properly uh and that is so important technique over everything else and training 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 you can carry all the kit in the world and this is one of the big things uh one of the big drivers behind going through and doing this um was because we uh you know uh i guess had so many people roll onto the courses and have the world's kit or in fact some stuff that they probably shouldn't actually have been carrying uh and yeah, it was just it was just not cool. Guys guys rocking up with like decompression needles, unless you're trained to use that stuff, forget about it. The basics are what really saves lives. That's just being absolutely straight up. You know, you, you know if you're carrying around chest darts and stuff, which is actually technically illegal um, to supply them or actually be carrying around them with you as well, so Sales and Supply of Needles Act 92, check it out. Um, but going through and doing that uh, is just is just silly. You're carrying stuff which you're not trained to use, you're not proficient in, uh, and just forget about it. You stick to the basics and you'll be good to go. Um, so, yeah, um, keep sending those questions through. Um, we've got a few more to kind of tick through. Uh, we're going to continue through the list now. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the emergency bandage. Um, there is various different types of compression bandage out there. I favor the emergency bandage. Uh, absolutely fantastic bit of kit. Uh, supplies a lot of pressure down. I like the four inch just because you can get into junctional areas um, as well around the neck, uh, into awkward areas, uh, as opposed to six inch, which has a bit more fluff sticking out the sides. But there's also the eight inch as well, which is more kind of your uh, dealing with um, wrapping up or uh, managing uh, more major trauma, abdominal trauma, uh, and of course, uh, dealing with um, the aftermath of amputation as well. Um, there, there is all sorts of uh, pressure bandage out there. There's the OLEAS, there's, uh, of course, what we stock and use, the emergency bandage. Um, there's, there's, there's tons of them out there, H&H, &H, uh, various different ones out there. Um, personally, I think the emergency bandage is the easiest to use under duress. Uh, the reason why we stock it and use it, uh, not only is it NZDF issue, so I was kind of familiar with it, uh, but it also uh, is so much easier to use than anything else that I have used uh, and played around with uh, when you're under pressure. And that's something that you really, really may, need to think about, okay? Um, because when you are under duress, when there is somebody injured or you're in a critical incident uh, and you're under duress, you need to think about losing your fine motor skills. And that's when your fingers turn into like bricks like this. Um, the more you kind of do it, the more you kind of go through it, the easier it becomes. Um, but yeah, just just please always think about that. Um, another way that you get around this is obviously going through and using a fresh product, brand new product to go through and, um, you know, making sure that you get onto them with the... Um, uh with the um with the training okay so don't don't ever forget that don't ever forget that having heaps of comments come through um gareth pert um has just brought up one here downside to hemostatics question mark clean out of a wound after use of trauma okay so what we're talking about here is probably not so much the impregnated hemostatic gauze as such um that's generally very 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 safe to use um i haven't seen uh any evidence uh to support uh, the problems that have been had uh, with products such as the um, the granulated or the powder form, um, which is quite early stuff. There is companies, Jeep is still in New Zealand, are selling this stuff, which is insane. Um, but the problem which comes out of that is not so much the cleaning out. Yeah, it's going to piss the surgeon off, but they're a bit more professional. Um, it's more so to do with the distal thrombosis, which can occur afterward, um, which can be a real problem. So um, just for the record, PracMed, um, until we see anything really rock solid uh, in terms of peer-reviewed evidence, uh, we're just going to stay well away from those hemostatic um, pregnated uh, stuff. And the, of course, the granules um, are just not negotiable in that sense. In sense. Um, okay, so um, we'll push on a little bit. Um, I've already kind of covered the TQs a little bit, um, but also on top of that as well, you'll find inside of the IFAS uh, and most uh, IFACs as well, they should include an emergency blanket. Um, and kind of funny we mentioned that because we've got one to give away tonight. Um, this is the super slim line yet super effective um, Blizzard Compact Trauma Blanket. Uh, and this is a product by uh, Blizzard uh, Blizzard, uh, 
the Blizzard survival systems, and uh, yeah, we deal with them quite a bit. Um, we've, we've got a number of different products uh, by them, um, but yeah, we've got one of those to give away tonight. As I was saying, inside of the IFAC or IFAS, you should at least have, at very minimum, an emergency blanket, and that's because this is one of the big overlooked things within uh, dealing with a casualty, is going through uh, and, uh, you know, rocking with a... Um, you know, rocking with a patient who requires uh, to be managed for hypothermia afterward, okay? After you've stopped the bleeding and all that stuff, it is so, 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 so important to go through uh, and manage them for hypothermia. So uh, please remember that. Make sure you've got one of those inside of the um, bag there as well. Um, so just to recap on that before we move on, um, first of all, trauma shears, that's, uh, or a hook knife, absolutely bog standard. That's to remove the clothing very, very quickly to assess. We've got a tourniquet for limb extremities. We've got packing gauze for any junctional wounds, that's neck, armpits, and groin pelvic region. Um, that's the areas that we can't use a tourniquet with. Um, we've got a chest seals, that's for any penetrating trauma, essentially above the belly button. Um, and of course, we've got our uh, emergency bandage for um, extremities or, or junctional areas, even even the head, um, for wounds which can be dealt with or minor wounds which can be dealt with uh, simply through that compression uh, and that dressing. We also uh, have the emergency uh, blanket uh, or blizzard bag option there as well to manage our, uh, manage our um, casualty after the bleed has been controlled. Alrighty, so um, what we're going to go through now is kind of cover a little bit further into that. So we had a really good question come in tonight, uh, or earlier today, sorry, and that was about uh, what we should do when dealing with shock and what would you carry in a slightly larger kit. Awesome question. So um, as most people um, are probably unaware, this is uh, there. There is a book, like huge, massive book, um, on all the various different types of shock. When we're talking about blood loss or uh, bleeding, uh, somebody who suffered a lot of bleeding, we're talking about hypovolemic shock or, or low blood volume uh, of shock, with the body going into compensatory shock because of the, the blood loss. When we're dealing with that hypothermia uh, is part of what is known as a lethal triad. So this is a uh, process which your body basically goes into uh, and it starts to self-cascade or starts to transcend uh, further and further and further into shock um, because uh, basically you've lost blood, uh, your body is cooling down, uh, you're starting to switch systems in terms of fuel systems, you're starting to retain um, more toxins and of course your body starts to uh, go into a process of metabolic acidosis. Long story short, um, of those three things which you can control, um, uh, which which uh, is really, really easy at a basic life support level, uh, is to go through and manage uh, for hypothermia. Um, nobody that I can find has survived entering uh, an ED, and this is through multiple studies, um, particularly over in the States, entered an ED uh, with core te temperature lower than 32 degrees Celsius. Now, that is from the trauma, trauma aspect, sorry. Now, when you're talking that uh, that trauma aspect versus um, environmental uh, onset of hypothermia, people can be brought back at extremely low range temperatures, way lower than that. But at that at that range, that doesn't give you a lot to work with. When you're dealing with 35 and a half to 37 and a half degrees um, for a human body temperature, um, you know, 35, 32 degrees at base level um, or 32 degrees at base level before, you know, you're just not going to make it is um, in, 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 in a big way, not a good place to be. So what can we do about that? Um, we can we can obviously go through and use these different systems. We, uh, we, we personally, we stock a number of different ones. Uh, I carry um, them on me. So we've got this one here, obviously, that we're giving away tonight. Okay, um, and that's just the compact blizzard bag. This one's awesome for your hunters, trampers, all that. Really small, lightweight. Um, gives you a lot of punch. It's double walled, so it gives you that kind of added factor um, of management of that hypothermia. Um, we've got the bags. Um, I've trialed one of those before. Um, absolutely fantastic. Much to the disgust of my hunting partner. I'm surprised I didn't have to stop and bleed myself. Um, and of course, we actually have the active rewarming bag as well, uh, which is just uh, next next level next uh, yeah next level technology. Absolutely fantastic, and has uh, active rewarming bags or pads inside of it, um, which give you that added uh, aspect of obviously managing that hypothermia. So that's um that's a really 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 uh, useful tool. Now, just seen here um, uh, on the quick Q and A that we've got a question here from Cody, and it's um, in regards to salox salad. 
and very simply, no, we don't. Um, just uh, We're going to post this clip up afterward um, for people to go back and make reference to. Um, so you can go back and have a look, I suppose, um, and we answer everything about the hemostatic. So, yeah, feel free to jump on later on. Um, Rightio. Um, yeah, keep, keep, keep the questions rolling through anyway, team. Um, got some good ones in there. Uh, downside to hemostatics. Um, yeah, we've already answered that. Uh, elite first aid packing gauze. Um, is it as good as NAR, North American Rescue Packing Gores? Um, short answer, Ken, is that I don't know, uh, and that's because I haven't used it. Um, the reason why I haven't used it uh, is because there's a million and one different products out there, and um, you know, uh, I simply wouldn't be able to get around them all. Uh, we use the North, a lot of the North American Rescue stuff uh, simply because it is top of the line, um, along with the other brands that we do associate and use as well. And that is not from uh, anecdotes or people's opinions. That is through uh, the evidence which is backing it, um, of course, as well. So, yeah, um, long story short, uh, I'm not too sure about that. Just using the NAR stuff and we'll be good. Um, okay, so, <laughs> gosh. All right, we've just had... Oh, is it that time? Okay, so we just had a question come through. Can you cauterize a bullet wound using a cartridge like in Rambo? Okay, um, so, um, <laughs> wow. All right, um, I, I suppose this is kind of relevant. I get asked about cauterizing a lot. And what this really comes back to, I suppose, largely is improvising. Um, and that is um, basically, uh, if, you, if you improvise, if you if you if if that is what you do, if you are an improvising person, you're not going to have time uh, to go through and sort yourself out. If you are trying to cauterize uh, using uh, gunpowder, um, you know it doesn't really matter what type it is. Pouring it onto a wound and lighting it on fire, um, man, are you going to hurt yourself? Probably cause the injury to be a ton worse. Um, and I'm just simply not going to advocate that uh, at all. So um, yeah. Um, uh, very, very simply, um, I, I, I've I, never done it. I'm not going to advocate it. There's a good reason why it's not um, TCCC uh, approved or acknowledged even. Uh, and that's just because it just, yeah, it's it's not coming into question. We have way better ways, which are going to be way less painful to um, go through and manage that. Um, just had another question here. I'm going to jump on this one right now. What makes PracMed NZ, uh, or PracMed in this case, better than other first aid trainers? Okay, so this is a really good question. Glad you asked that. What is our point of difference? Okay, so here's the point of difference. 15 years military and uh, private security industry. Um, didn't do as much as uh, many, but I did more than most in terms of what we've been through uh, and what I've had to deal with as well. The difference between what we do in military and a contra uh, in a a private military context is that we go through and we deal with real first aid. First aid is the initial life-saving actions of somebody who has been injured right in front of you. It is not responding to a phone call. It's not responding to a call out or anything like that. When you can bleed to death as little as a, you know a couple of minutes before you start losing consciousness, if not uh, going into complete um, failure or cardiac failure, um, that is just something that we just cannot muck about with. Um, we teach real first aid at PRACMED NZ. So what we go through and do, we focus on the things which can actually save lives. If you don't know how to put an ice pack on your ankle, uh, if you don't know how to go through and go to the doctor uh, or, or maybe clean out a graze on your knee, uh, then I, I, you know, I'm kind of surprised you made it this far, to be honest with you. Um, our, our big point of difference is that every single one of us, every one of our trainers has been through, we've been tested, they we are all cut more or less from the same cloth with varying degrees of ability. No experiences are exactly the same, um, but we've all been there and done that. We understand what real first aid is. Simple. So that's what makes us different. Um, we focus on the real things, the real aspects. Um, rightio. Uh, okay, sweet. So the next question here is, do you carry duct tape in case you run out of chest seals? Um, very, very good question. Um, so... If I was to put it in, I'll put the question back toward you. Everybody here has felt blood at some point in their life, um, whether it be from a stake that you're carving up or whether you are a hunter and maybe uh, a home kill or maybe you've gone through and had to fix somebody up or whatever else, it's extremely slippery, okay? Um, and to be fair, 
uh, duct tape uh, on somebody's sweaty skin uh, and with a mixture of blood kind of flying about the place is just simply not going to do the job. So um, answer that very, very simply, no. No, I don't carry duct tape. I carry uh, multiple chest seals. Um, and when I, when I say chest seals, I carry uh, the North American Rescue ones. Um, I've got both occlusive, which is completely covering, and also vented as well. Um, that's in my main pack. Our IFAC or IFAS um, has the uh, vented in there and they come in a pack or two as well uh, to make sure that people go through uh, and uh, can manage um, potentially gunshot wounds where you have an entr entrance and an exit. Um, forbid you have to ever have to deal with that, but um, we definitely do have that on, okay? So um, yeah, awesome. Um, Right, we've got about 15 minutes, team, okay? Because um, it's actually a school night for me tonight, and I've been up since early this morning um, hauling ass on my various prac med things. Um, but we'll go through and answer a bunch of uh, questions still. Um, would you use a tourniquet on a very large laceration, even if it wasn't deep enough to hit any arteries or veins? The very short answer is this: is to this is no, okay? Um, for anybody who has seen uh, any kind of uh, real trauma uh, in particular to extremities, um, you'll notice that there isn't generally a ton of associated bleeding. Uh, and what we're talking about here is going through and, uh, for instance, I remember one of the, a, a really gnarly one that I saw, uh, which didn't have a bunch of bleeding with them. I'm just throwing an anecdote out here now um, to support this, is uh, a friend of mine, hopefully he's not watching, <laughs> Um, he slipped over during a uh, PT session and made a real mess of his leg. And it was on the outside of his uh, thigh there. Um, and there was no arterial bleeding, but it was hanging open. I mean, like, really hanging open. I, I remember looking inside this thing and going, wow. Um, but there wasn't that much bleeding. Um, unless you do hit uh, a decent vessel, there generally won't be. And um, the, the, the question specifically um, in regards to tourniquet use is that when you look at bleeding, uh, it, it's, it's not the trauma, it's the bleeding that we have to look at. You need to accurately go through and uh, obviously look at that. If you have an arterial bleed above the knee, uh, above the elbow, then you know that's getting tourniqueted straight away. If you have an amputation where there has completely had, uh, somebody's had a part of their limb removed, you know that that's getting a tourniquet um, straight up because the object of that, the object of the tourniquet is not to, uh, how to put it, it's not to keep everything squeezed back together. Um, the object of the tourniquet is to stop fluid from escaping the body um, because obviously when that happens, it can't go back in. Um, you can't kind of pick it up off the ground, scoop it up and you know put it back into the wound or anything like that. So um, very, very simply, um, uh, my, my answer to that question directly is no. Um, I would look at uh, simply direct pressure, uh, if anything. Um, and it's a very, very subjective question as well. Uh, there's no two wounds that I've ever seen which have been exactly the same. Um, there's no uh, two wounding profiles which are, are exactly the same. Um, so it is very subjective. It's about going through understanding, uh, taking your time to actually look at what you're doing and making a good, accurate decision. That, that is a huge part of what, what we teach uh, on the Stop and Bleed course is making those accurate decisions. Okay, so um, hopefully that answers that question. So the next question we've got here is typical worst workplace first aid just refreshes are due every two years. In your experience, is this sufficient for everyday uh, people um, or Joe Blogs? Um, my answer to this is really, really, really simply no. Uh, and the analogy that I'm going to put to this is basically, okay, let's, let's talk about boxing. So if I uh, went through and jumped in the ring and fought for the New Zealand, uh, you know, light heavyweight title and I happened to win it by some freaking miracle um, and then I didn't train at all for the next two years, literally did not train at all, uh, and my opponent who decided he was going to come and have a go at me uh, for my title uh, trained, you know, four or five plus uh, times a week, six, seven hours a day, and we got in the ring at the end of two years and I'm sitting there freaking, you know, eating pizzas and just carrying on. Um, then I would probably guarantee without a single shred of doubt <laughs> that I would get my head beaten in probably within the first 40 seconds of round one. So what I'm saying here is basically if you don't train, then you can expect to fall to your level of training, which is nil. Okay, um, and if you have a little training in the past, then maybe it might get you through to a certain extent. But the reality is that workplace refresher courses are a complete joke. That is part of the reason why I left my old job. Uh, That's part of the reason why I started PracMed, was to change the conversation. We certainly have. Uh, people are pricking up. I know there's people probably watching this or will watch this um, who we're probably putting the shits up a wee bit. Um, uh, do I care about that? No. 
the reason why I'm doing this is to bring real first aid from almost 20 years of global war on terror uh, in terms of the experiences people have, not just the experiences, but the information, the fact, to your door and say, hey, we can compile this into a, into a very minimum four and a half hour course, Stop the Bleed, and teach you the basics which will keep people alive. That is it. Um, so when, when it comes to workplace first aid, uh, sh the short, the long and the short of it is no. Uh, most of the courses suck, uh, and that's just been completely straight up. Uh, I have no problem in saying that because I've done a ton of these courses, uh, and um, yeah, just simply have not been impressed by any of them so far. Um, there are some some good ones out there um, around the place, but um, yeah, uh, if I was you, um, enroll with PracMed. <laughs> Um, okay, so next question. Um, so we've got one here. Would you use a TQ on a person that has multiple severed digits? So we're talking, I guess, hands and feet. Um, so short answer is no. Okay, so if someone's just missing the tips of fingers, if they've just gone across with a bandsaw or whatever else, uh, that kind of injury is generally going to be reasonably easily controlled, uh, compressible. Oh, it's a compressible injury. Um, when Again, when we're using TQs, uh, I would prefer that you did use one than didn't use one. Um, but when you're dealing with just the, the, the digits, your fingers, if they if the, a couple of them would come off or one of them would come off because the band saw or whatever else, um, don't get too don't get too wild about that. Obviously bag it in a clean bag that's um, you know inside of your first aid kit, hopefully. Um, and go through and get that thing off to ED to control a bleed um, in a lot of in a lot of cases, especially with digits and so on. Um, it is quite controllable. I got scars all over my hands and fingers um, from various things. Some of them uh, were my own fault. Some of them weren't. Uh, but either way, um, those injuries uh, were all compressible uh, quite easily. Not that I've lost a finger um, so far. So yeah, um, TQing a um, TQing a limb uh, for a missing digit. Nah, man, no, nah, wouldn't advise it. Um, Okay, so the next one we've got here. This is a really good question. Really good question. We've got a, we've got tons of questions coming through. Please keep them coming. Um, we'll try and do our best to get on to them as well. And if I don't get them through, uh, or we might extend by five or ten minutes, but if we don't uh, get on to all of them, then I'll go through and I will answer them later on. So do you believe in DRS, M-A-R-C-H-H, or Doctor's March, which is one of the algorithms of many algorithms which are out there, um, which are essentially a decision-making process uh, for dealing with uh, traumatic or life-threatening situations. So um, in a first aid context. So Doctors, uh, Doctors March H, what does that stand for? Uh, danger, response, uh, send for help, and then we go into a more military uh, kind of algorithm as such with massive bleed, airway, respiration, uh, circulation, head injury, hypothermia. Uh, and that is a very, very comprehensive algorithm. It's quite a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> I kind of sit there and just kind of revisit the old memory bank a little bit. Um, yeah, it is. It's a great, um, it's a, it's a great first response tool. Um, but I'll tell you right now, the best response tool that you can go and use uh, is the one that you train with. Okay, uh, we covered that question just before training wise. Um, if you if you forget about the stuff, if you don't train on it semi regularly, um, then you're just gonna you're gonna end up falling off the boat. It's like anything else, um, except the analogy I used before was a sport. This isn't a sports game, man. Okay, um, first aid emergencies happen every single day in this country. Today, there was five cardiac incidents that had to be responded to by, you know, the various ambulance services which are running around out there. Um, make sure that your training is on point because you never know when it's going to come to call, you know. Um, at worst, if you go through and invest in good first aid kit and training, you never, ever, ever use it. Well, you haven't really lost anything, okay? So that's really important. Okay, so next one. Um, do your uh, do your first aid courses cover work safe compliance? Okay, awesome question. Um, long and short of it is, yeah, absolutely they do. Um However, WorkSafe does recommend that you use a NZQA accredited uh, provider. Um, and that's really interesting because we've got our big meeting with NZQA next week, uh, which is going to be cool, to become a PTE or private training establishment. Um, so after that, we'll uh, kind of see where we sit and stand uh, with regards to that. Um, initially, no, we won't be able to deliver unit standards. Um, but after that, um, you know, the process, uh, we've at least got our foot in the door, uh, pretty simply. Um when you look at what's actually required um, from uh, a, a point of view of work, workplace refreshers uh, as such, we can absolutely deliver workplace refreshers. Our essential, work uh, essential first aid skills that we're running tomorrow in Tauranga, uh, awesome course. We focus on decision-making process. We follow uh, focus on uh, good CPR and also instilling confidence in people to use AEDs. Uh, and, of course, we have the Stop the Bleed course in there as well. So, yeah, definitely. Um, 
Next question here. Um, yeah, we do have plans for a Palmerston North course, and I'll move straight on to the next one. Do you think it is uh, important sorry, to carry a splint in an IFAS or an IFAC? Very interesting question. So when you look at splints, uh, what is the purpose and point of a splint? Um, it's basically to stabilize uh, a broken bone. Um, in an IFAC itself, probably not. That's when I'd be looking at Maybe if I was going to carry a splint, personally I don't uh, in the bush, but if I was going to carry a splint, I'd look at carrying one uh, in, in a, uh, inside of my pack, inside of my tramping or my hunting kit. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's, that's definitely uh, what I'd, I'd look at doing in, in the sense of going through uh, and storing that in there. In your actual IFAC itself, no, uh, because it's going to go ahead and obviously uh, start, start to cause a little bit of confusion um, in terms of just having more stuff. Just remember we, when we went through at the start, the focus of an IFAC or IFAS, as I prefer to call them, is to make sure simplicity is there, okay? So we're looking at going through and making sure uh, we have... Uh, as little kit inside of the actual, um, as little equipment inside of the kit as possible, uh, that is going to do the most for you. That is so important. Splints, broken bones, they're way down on the list, man. Um, quite frankly, uh, we, we do teach, uh, we have got some awesome courses coming out for more advanced kind of uh, fracture management. Um, yeah, stand by, stand by for that. Okay, <laughs> cheap cat TQs. All right, let's talk about TQs. Um, so we source our TQs from um, obviously Pharmaco, uh, which are the uh, registered importers um, for cat uh, here in New Zealand. Um, and we send them out to you much like, where are we? Okay, so we've got an IFAS here. Um, we send them out to you like this, okay, inside the little package there. And the reason why we do that um, is to show you that it is legit. Um, if you're paying, uh, I mean, Look, there, there might be somebody's like literally selling them at cost price or whatever. Get in on it, okay? Do it. Um, we can't afford to do that. Um, obviously, this is a business as well. Um, we sell them as cheap as we can with the minimal markup that we possibly can to be sustainable as a business. Um, but cheap cats, um, if the if they're anything less than about sixty bucks, then there is no way that that's going to be a legit cat. Um, and if you have one that you're a little concerned about, if you're coming onto a course, great, bring it with you, okay? I'm not going to belittle you. Um, I'm certainly not going to um, have a go at you for bringing your own equipment on the course and ask me whether it's legit. I'll go through uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you straight away. Other ways that you can go through and check yourself, uh, have a look on the back. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see that too well. There we go. So this is just a training tourniquet. Um, it's a Cat Gen 7, pretty much exactly, well, it's exactly the same thing. It's just blue. Um, go through and have a look on the back uh, of your cat tourniquet um, or your cat and just make sure it's got all the information there, um, you know, your NSN, uh, your manufacturer, um, just all, all the company information that you would usually have uh, on the uh, actual TQ. That, that is really important. Um, there is a bunch of companies selling uh, in, in New Zealand selling equipment and it's not just wish.com, um, but these these people are selling uh, tourniquets which... Um, aren't real uh, cat, um, and it is really, really, really dangerous. Uh, people are buying this stuff uh, thinking they're getting a great deal, uh, and that, that is just not okay. Uh, it's not right, they shouldn't be doing that, uh, and it sucks for the consumer as well, uh, because obviously it'll go through, um, and uh, obviously, yeah, it just, just sucks. The, um, the the main reason why I hate the, the, the knockoffs and so on uh, is... Because even even though some of them are reasonably okay, um, the components inside of them, in particular the windlass, and also the uh, pressure or the pressure plate in behind the one with the manufacturing information, everything like that, um, that uh, that 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 tends to go okay. That tends to stretch, tends to give, and when you're dealing with the amount of pressure required to occlude a limb, especially uh, if you have somebody with bigger, you know, really big legs or whatever else, then uh, that's going to cause you a massive problem. We went Facebook Live a while ago uh, and basically put one to the test, and it was a really good knockoff. Somebody bought it into the course uh, and was willing to uh, donate it to the course, and basically uh, we went through, uh, we tested it out, and sure enough, it failed. So um, yeah, there was there was the um, there was our kind of. Um, that was our kind of test. These ones here, I uh, put a post about the other day. This one here in particular, this has been through a thousand plus applications now. Uh, stop counting at uh, a thousand. 
but it's been through a thousand applications. I'm just kind of um, fascinated to see when it's eventually going to give out. It has to eventually. Um, but that's the reliability and the uh, you know the, the the solidness of their genuine um, cat resources tourniquets. They are just absolutely fantastic. So if you're concerned about that, please get in touch, uh, and I'll do my best to identify whether it's legit or not. Either way, you know for a fact that you're buying legit cat stuff um, if you're coming through uh, Pragmed NZ. Um, we, we just don't deal with that. We know that people's lives are simply worth way more. Okay, so the next question, um, how important is it to carry airways? Um, okay, so by airways, I'm guessing that people mean uh, NP, so nasal pharyngeal airways or uh, OPAs, oral pharyngeal uh, airways. Uh, in this context, I think that's probably where we'll stop without going too far down the rabbit's hole. Um, so uh, for me, not particularly um, at this point. Yes, I do carry uh, OPA uh, in my main bag, uh, NPA, yes, um, have I used them ever in New Zealand? No, I haven't, um, largely because I don't work in this context in NZ. Um, but when, when, we, when we talk about NPA or OPA, what are you actually trying to achieve? That is the thing. Um, and I think the biggest uh, thing behind uh, carrying airway uh, management devices or adjuncts is going through and making sure you're trained properly with them because they can cause a hindrance as well. Um, in my opinion, in my experience, positioning is huge. Uh, and unless you're working uh, with a team who actually understands uh, or you're working uh, with people who understand OPA uh, or NPA, um, then no, I, I, I just don't, um, I, I don't think in the civilian context they really have that much of a place at basic life support level. Above basic life support level, yeah, maybe. Tactical, yeah, absolutely. Um, but in, in a BLS context, no. Okay, very, very simply. Um, individual first aid kit, are you going to be inserting your own EMP? Mm, don't think so. Okay, um, it's just it's just not going to be the case. Okay, next question. Um, do you think most first aid courses have too much in them and a lot of you, what uh, a lot of it you don't have to use? Uh, very, very easy to answer, and that is absolutely. Um, as I've kind of mentioned before or earlier uh, this evening, when you're dealing with um, first aid courses or going through and dealing with a first aid course, um, the, the things that we should be really focusing on is that things that are relevant to what we actually do every day, relevant to our workplace, uh, and obviously the things which are actually going to kill us in a matter of minutes before the paramedics, uh, before the EMT get through to us and can start working. Okay, so what are we talking about here? We're talking about uh, people going into cardiac arrest. We're talking about managing somebody who's, you know, potentially going into cardiac arrest and having to go through making a decision whether to do CPR and defibrillate them. We're talking about bleeding. Uh, we're talking about penetrating chest trauma. We're talking about management of burns uh, and not so much the broken bone side of the house unless you're working in a uh, more remote or uh, 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 environment. Um, good things to know that you're probably not going to need to sit in front of a, a lecturer uh, and listen to all the war stories about uh, for the whole afternoon. But things which are really good to know are things like asthma. Awesome. Okay. Um, if people are getting taught properly uh, about the emergency procedure and, you know, the do's and do nots for asthma attacks and anaphylaxis and choking and all the rest of it, then then great. You know, um, choking is definitely something that we cover off on as well, um, as that's something which does affect, uh, you know, gen, gen pop quite a lot. Um, so yeah, uh, that, that is, that is a really, really good question. Um, and definitely, uh, something that, um, yeah, we, we have, we've cut a lot of that out. We focus heavily on what you can actually have cause and effect on, uh, which will save somebody's life rather than the million different things out there, um, which are just going to leave you confused, probably go in one ear and out the other, not in my case, cause I wear hearing aids. <laughs> Um, but you get what I mean, you know, um, people just data dump after they get done, uh, with, uh, all that stuff. Um, okay, sweet. So, rightio, um, uh, well, we've got a question here. What brand of BVM do you use? Okay, so, um, this is a really good question. Um, so we use micro BVM, um, that's supplied through to us by Persis Medical, um, they are one of our biggest kind of, we're, we're one of their biggest fans and hopefully they're one of our biggest fans. Um, we, yeah, we use the micro BVM um, and that is a fantastic, super compact uh, unit which doesn't weigh very much uh, and basically expands it. It has everything you kind of need in there uh, without the lines uh, and basically uh, gives you gives you everything you need. 
Um, so that is basically the long and the short of it. Um, yeah, with regards to BVMing uh, here. Um, yeah, so we've just had an anecdote here come from Damien. Um, I hate sitting there for hours because I forgot um, it's, it's so much to take in. Yeah, I agree. Totally agree. Um, that's why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and making sure that we um, go through and um, give people the, the good stuff. Um, one thing I can promise you is our courses will not put you to sleep. You won't be sitting down very long. Um, if you want to go ahead and read the 100 plus reviews that we've got on Google, on Facebook, um, go hard. Our training is very different. We're a new breed of first aid trainer. We're a new breed of first aid company, uh, and we're setting the market standard that simple in New Zealand here. Um, don't forget that we do have 20% off open courses right now. Um, that's because we were supposed to be at a safety show last week. Uh, COVID had other plans, so now we can't do that. Uh, take that opportunity to book any time this year. You get 20% off um, any of the open uh, sorry, uh, yeah, open courses, uh, and 10% uh, is currently being discounted off private courses as well. So if you do uh, have people or if you do have a uh, work base or community who wants to come through and do a bit of training, uh, tell them to get on board, tell them to contact us, uh, we don't muck about with it, our car classes are friendly, they are approachable, they are fun, and most of all, they are super, super, super informative. Um, team, that is pretty much all I really have to go through, or all the time I have to go through tonight. Um, oh, hang on, we've got one more here, and it is one which kind of hits me uh, in a bit of a spot, and that is EpiPens, useful for remote area kits. Okay, um, EpiPens are absolutely useful for remote area kits. Um, I think this is going to be a, a, a conversation that we're going to have to continue on another night uh, at some point. Uh, but I just want to talk about EpiPens real quick. It is kind of like a TQ situation, except it's quite specific. When you're dealing with somebody who's anaphylactic, i.e. they've been pre-exposed, they know they have uh, you know, those massive release of histamine and whatnot, they, they understand that, they know that. They need to carry this stuff with them. Um, that that is a really important thing. I've had some really, uh, I've had some real tragedy uh, with EpiPen uh, coming through. Um, I had a uh, I had a client come through who had lost a family member the weekend before they came through a course um, because that person didn't have the EpiPen with them. Um, anecdotal, I know it happens way more than it should. Uh, it's one of the things which really breaks my heart. I think. There is some. There was at least some plan uh, for some sort of government funding. I think at some point, but I'm not too sure whether Pharmac does or does not uh, currently fund uh, or partially fund EpiPens. Heartbreaking stuff. I know. Um, it is. It is what it is. So to answer your question uh, directly, Drew. Yes, uh, I believe so. Um, as anything else, if you have one, you have none. If you have two, if you have one, uh, with EpiPens. Bear in mind cost and also that they have an expiry date. Generally, uh, a year uh, on what they uh, what they advertise on the box or the the actual sorry on the actual pen itself. Um, but yeah, just um, just be mindful of that. Very 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 important. What I was kind of getting to at the start um, was that if you do have somebody that you know is anaphylactic, um, or if you um, yeah if you have somebody around who's anaphylactic, um, make sure they have their, their, their medication on them. Uh, it's, it's super jack. Uh, and that's a term that we'd use for people uh, who wouldn't kind of do their thing or play their role within the military. It's super jack for somebody who knows they've got a condition uh, to not go through and uh, obviously uh, carry their medication. Same as asthmatics uh, or anybody else who relies uh, on any kind of medication to keep them kind of ticking over. So yeah, really, really good question. Team, um, what a wicked night. Where on earth has like the better part of an hour just gone uh yeah almost an hour now that's crazy um so keep on uh flicking your questions through if you do have questions around first aid um what i'm going to do is i'm going to start compiling those up uh and then we'll, we'll figure out another night we'll figure out another time to meet back here and um yeah we'll go through um what we're going to cover next week sorry um just tapping in there, almost forgot, we are going to go through, um, we've got uh, a bit of a collaboration we're doing with somebody in about a week's time, uh, we're going to be going on and doing a day session at 10 hundred hours or 10 a.m., I should be saying 10 a.m., <laughs> being a civvy now and all that stuff, um, on Friday, and we're going to be covering kids, okay, so uh, problems uh, associated with and first aid for infants, 
uh, pediatrics, uh, and that is obviously something which will probably pertain more to the mums and bubs, um, but anybody is welcome. Obviously, it's going to be free. More details uh, will be coming through on that. Um, and yeah, basically uh, 10 a.m. Friday, mums and bubs. Um, thank you so much for everybody who came along, uh, jumped on board, had some really good questions. Uh, we've had some interesting ones come through as well. Uh, sorry if I didn't answer any questions about uh, some of the stuff which got sent through. Uh, we try and keep PG here with the Prac Med. Uh, but either way, uh, team, hopefully uh, get to meet you in person at some point. Stay safe out there, look after yourself, and hopefully this has provided you the basis to go through and make an intelligence decision about whether or not uh, or what you should carry inside of an IFAS. Cheers, team. Thank you.